Welcome to Walk About the Galaxy, the humane astronomy podcast, where the science is universal, the opinions are personal, and no animals are harmed during its production. We are Strange Charm and Top the Astroquarks, also known as Josh Caldwell, Patty Dove, and Jim Cooney, coming to you from the Walkabout Studio at the University of Central Florida. Remember to subscribe to us on all platforms, including YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and no others, because that's all of them. We are also on something called the World Wide Web at www.walkaboutthegalaxy.com, where you can marvel at just how out of date our website is. But you can also <laughs> make a contribution to STEM research and get a free Walkabout t-shirt in exchange for your contribution. Nice. Oh, excellent. That so it's kind good. of free, but not really. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't most things free, not really? We're not really free. Our stumper today is moon basil. Mm, basil? Basil. 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 Um, you get to put a base on the moon. You are you have been called by NASA. They said, you know, we were going to do this whole process with committees and things like mm -hmm. that. But instead, you, Addy Dove, and you, Jim Cooney, oh. will each independently mm -hmm. Josh Caldwell. suggest where the moon base will be. And that is it for the next, say, 40 years. Whoa, 40? Yeah, for U.S. human presence on the moon. Okay. Jim Where do you want to put that base? Addie is taking her right of first refusal yes. okay. to pass. Okay. 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 Uh, okay. So Addie is, uh, of course, considerably more knowledgeable about the moon and locations on the moon and I so forth. I haven't thought of it like this before, so... Yeah. So my choice is this is my. I thought like, about maybe should I give Jim a different one? Like where would you put a base on a black hole or something? But <laughs> that didn't really seem to make much sense. Titan. No, I'm, I'm putting on a base Titan. on the moon. Damn it! I'm okay. putting a base on the moon. Great. Um, but I'm I'm much like the uh, you know the non sports fan who plays uh, fantasy football Armchair and quarterback. Then just, she, this is actually what Addie does yes. uh, when she is a sports fan. But she when she plays uh, fantasy football, she chooses based on like names. Or Which uniforms. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna base it on uh, cool names of places on the moon. Ooh, I like okay. This. So I was thinking maybe I could put it at uh, Mare Fessendatus. Oh, Fessendatus. could you spell that place? Fes at least the first part. F is it is starting with an F? F E C U N D. So it's I T A T I S. A if it's it's uh, it's right, the sea it's fertile. of fundity. Yes, it's it's a, it's, a, a, it's a fertile. Sea? That's fertile. It's, it's fertile. It's fecund. Isn't it is, the sea yes. of fertility? Yeah. In English, no, no, it's a sea of. Well, it's a sea of uh, fecundity. English. In English, that's a so word. So that gives gives rise. I mean, to... I was waiting for Josh to pounce on my pronunciation of it, but uh... well, I was trying to figure out what the hell you were saying. Yeah. First, that's why I asked you to spell well, it. That it's not a word you. I couldn't correct your pronunciation <laughs> because yeah. it was or so. Or sea of fertility. That's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's where um, you're going for sea of fertility, possibly, or because you're planning on going there to that base, uh -huh. and you're like, oh yeah, yeah. it's a fertile sea. <laughs> it's fertile. <laughs> uh, either that, or uh, uh, there is a oh shoot, what is it? Uh... Uh, Where is the Sea of Fecundity? I don't. I have no idea. Seven point eight degrees south, fifty one point three degrees east. Okay, so it's equatorial, probably near side, but because yeah. since most of most the seas of are, are, yeah, most yeah, are. okay. Or uh, Rupes Recta. Oh, going in a sort of different direction there, <laughs> just because it's hilarious. <laughs> God. And I've scene. abused myself. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's not actually funny, but uh, <laughs> I think rupees is some kind of like uh, an escarpment. Uh, so they, uh, they have uh, so uh, like a cliff. So uh -huh. I'm going to hang out under the cliff. Okay. The cliff edge. All <laughs> right. Rupees. And just giggle. Recta. You're just going just gonna to go there and giggle. So you're either going to go there. To have sex or just to have a really rollicking, hilarious time. That's it. There One you go. One of those two places. This is my, uh, now, now I'm actually interested in where Addie's going to put it because it probably has scientific uh, purpose or something. But Low gravity on the moon makes all that more fun anyway. Yeah. Right. Jumping off cliffs. Sounds Let's like die. the voice of experience, which intrigues me. But anyway, I mean, I've done I've done lunar parabolas on the on the parabolic flights, and I've done like push ups and stuff, and that's way more fun than doing push ups in one G. Okay, <laughs> keep it clean, everyone. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying anything. Um, so I like I like that. I should have thought of it in terms of the 
fun. Because if you have Moonbase, it's got to have a cool name. Yeah. Uh, well, you can name it anything you want, true. no matter where the it is. Jam Moonbase. <laughs> um, so currently, NASA is looking at the South Pole, South Polar region for its lunar base because there's potentially water resources. There's these interesting regions that are both permanently shadowed, but also more permanently illuminated. So have illumination during most of the year. Yeah, it's one of these power options. It's one of these sort of funny things that. Is obvious if you think about it, but sounds contradictory before you think about it, which is that places that are always dark are right next to places that are always bright. Yeah, and it has to do with like the fact that the always darks are down in a crater and the always brights are up at the um, high peak, the, the high rim parts of that of the crater. At the rim of the yeah. crater. And, but South Polar terrain is actually pretty gnarly in a lot of places. Uh-huh. There's a mm-hmm. lot of like craters that are, have these sort of high topography. Um, so it's like sort of tricky overall. Yeah. So but question maybe for this moon base is like, it could how, be what kind cool of mobility rock climbing. do we have? What kind of mobility do we have? Um, well, not global. No. You know, sort of county scale. Okay. Mobility. You got maybe, let's say you can go 30, 30 clicks because that's what they measure things on the moon in clicks. Oh, okay. How long yeah. click? They do some rock climbing in um, a mile. It's about, the... it's about 100 micro clicks. <laughs> <laughs> 100 yeah, micro clicks? Really? 100, give or take. It's, it's give 100 or take. micro clicks. It's 100. It is, it is surprising. Everything's a little bit it's... different on the moon. Um, I like everything's like one sixth on the moon. That's right. <laughs> I like, love it. Yeah, it's, so it's really 16 micro clicks. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think I would do somewhere south. I do like I think those are south good arguments, pole. and I would do somewhere south pole. Or I would do um, near side south pole because right. far side would be would be cool in terms of like some of the astronomy and just because like yeah. we think that there's some better resources over on that side, but. Then you'd have to worry about having a, a relay station for right. communications. Whereas I'm, if you were on the near side, you would always be facing the Earth. And I think that's pretty crucial. I agree. I'm you're... definitely, for wherever it is, I'm saying near side because I want to see the Earth. Yeah. Not just for communications, but also because it would be awesome. Be so cool. And it's always going to be um, at the same. No. No. You have yes. Seen... No, no, there's like Earth rise and set and stuff like that. Right. It's confusing. No. If you're no. near the pole, you if should be able on... to go from the near side to the far side pretty yeah, easily. Yeah, again with the rough topography, though. Oh, I was going to say then you could then you could set up your telescopes a few clicks. Away. Like if you're moves, on synchronous like rotation, if you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, which it is. But there's then like the, the, the Earth will always be so there. It uh, bit, it's going to wobble a little bit. It's the sun that's going to be rising and setting, but not the Earth. Yes. <laughs> so you want to be on the near Just side? Just like okay. when you're on the Earth, the sun rises and sets, but the Earth doesn't. But the moon but also the moon rises also and yeah, sets. Yeah, yeah. So just, the, 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 uh, uh, where's yours, Josh? On also, the near side. On the near side. Just yes. Anywhere on the near side. Uh, if the fecundity place is on the near side, I'll go with that one. Cool. <laughs> or uh, actually, maybe with the other one, just to see Jim giggling there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I like sun. I like daylight. So the whole long dark or sun always on the horizon part of the south polar i think i would find that depressing sure yeah mm-hmm. so i might get some lunar seasonal affective disorder if i were down in the mm-hmm. south polar region today we'll talk about the large scale structure of the universe with some new observations of forty thousand quasars from the sloan digital sky survey citizen science uh, maybe astronomy will cure cancer after all. But first, this episode of Walk About the Galaxy is brought to you by the Dumbbell Nebula. Ooh. If you're tired of always trying to impress the boss or struggling to find the right way to phrase a response to your teacher or parent, take a break in the Dumbbell Nebula. Growing for nearly 10,000 years, the Dumbbell Nebula is an expectation-free space in space. Head over to the constellation Volpecula and enjoy our cool blue and purple hues excited by our central white dwarf, Take in the view without worrying about that next report or presentation and enjoy some me time. The Dumbbell Nebula can be found as M27 or NGC 6853 on your GPS, but you'll want to engage your warp drive to get here as we are a thousand light years from Seoul. The Dumbbell Nebula. Taste the rainbow. Intriguing. I expected the Dumbbell Nebula to have some puns about weightlifting. <laughs> yeah, I went in a different direction. I mean, the they Dumbbell Nebula went in a different direction. Yeah. That one. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Skittles. Skittles. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Skittles. I want Skittles. 
I was uh, Starburst. Jessica yeah. always used to have Starburst in her office, but no, we don't. Sorry, there's no offices anymore. Um, did you notice in Space News that the auction for the Blue Origin seat on July 20th, 2021, Blue Origin suborbital rocket, you know, it's a little bit ridiculous. We're so excited about a suborbital rocket 60 yeah. years after our first but suborbital rocket, but it's, but it's kind of cool. taking non-astronauts. Right. In this case, taking a bunch of rich people. Yeah. So Jeff Bezos and his, his brother. brother. And uh, at least also the high like bidder. Be, like to be Jeff Bezos' brother. Yeah, maybe he's not rich. Maybe he's a yep. poor guy. Well, he's oh. getting a ride to space. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's pretty good. a lot of great gifts <laughs> from his brother. Yeah. yeah. Um, and at least the winner of this auction, so which has been in an online phase. Yes. And then tomorrow, we're recording this on June 11th. Tomorrow, June 12th at 1 p.m. Eastern, the... Um, <laughs> For our listeners, Addie is making funny faces in the studio here. Uh, there will be the live phase of the auction, which will conclude. And currently, it is at four point eight million. That was all dollars. I can afford right now. Four point eight dollars. Yeah, four point eight. <laughs> four point eight dollars. Four point eight million. So uh, I don't. We were, in principle, you can watch. I mean, they the the live part of the auction will be live streamed tomorrow on their website. For reference, Mark. Jeff Bezos' brother is six years younger, and he is a volunteer fireman who has his own private equity firm. Uh -oh. Interesting ordering of those two things. Uh -huh. So, also a rich guy. Yeah. They are close friends, and Jeff described him as the funniest guy in my life. I'm reading this right now. Okay. Well, in any event, uh, that ought to be tomorrow. So, it'll be interesting to hear what, you know, find out what, any, more, any more details you know about be? that. It's going to be Richard Branson. <laughs> Just kidding. It but definitely he won't be. Has said that he will be flying on July fourth. Well, I saw on Virgin Galactic rumors to that effect. But did he actually he say it? something about it? Did he really? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if he said July fourth. He tweeted that he is. What I saw from him was just, isn't it exciting that these two companies are now opening up space to people? And he... then, and there were some comments that like, oh, he's going to go on the fourth of July. In any event. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'll find out about that. Um, we talked last episode about NASA's next two Discovery class missions going to Venus. We did. And today, or yesterday, the European Space Agency announced that they are also going to Venus. Venus is the hot planet right now. Pun More intended. Ways than one. Bam. Boom. Um, yeah. They. So we talked about uh, Da Vinci Plus and Veritas last time, and this time. Uh, NASA, yeah, the ESA, European Space Agency's Envision mission, is has been selected. And that's, not, I think, happily not an acronym for anything. I didn't, yeah, I didn't see what it, I'm sure it's like something interesting, but I think it's just, I think it's, it's not it's an a acronym. It's just, yeah, it's a just a, yeah. And they're going to have another SAR, Synthetic Aperture Radar, and... And uh, uh, NASA's another providing instrument. Yeah. one of those. Yep. So Vensar is a synthetic ap aperture radar, and the subsurface sounding radar will also look at the top kilometer of the subsurface and look for layering cool. and boundaries. And then it has some spectrometers that are going to look for the, the atmosphere. Uh huh. Yeah, okay. the subsurface sounding is kind of amazing. Yeah. That you can do that, but if you send long enough wavelength light, uh, you get a signal back from the subsurface and. Uh, yeah, there's been some really cool stuff that the Sherrod instrument on one of the Mars orbiters has given us about, like, the polar caps on Mars and other surface structure, subsurface structure and stuff like that. So it has polar beneath. caps? On Mars? Mars? Oh, Mars. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Not Venus, definitely. Right. It's not. Yeah. yeah, it might, but they're not like that. Yeah. Right. Did you say there was other space news? Probably. Okay. Uh, oh, there was some fun pictures that came out today. From the VAB, from NASA, from the VAB. The Vertical they Assembly have. Building at Kennedy vehicle Space Center. Vehicle Assembly Building. The, sorry, the Vehicle yeah. Assembly Building. Which is the most giant building, and you can see it for so far yeah. when you're out here. Yeah. I love it so much. Um, but they, the SLS, two stages of the SLS rocket are in it now. Oh. And they took one of them and put it upright in the oh, VAB. Wow. wow. And it's just exciting to see. See, a very big rocket very big going rocket up in the VAB big again. Building. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Uh, did either of you watch the first episode of Transitioning to Nerd News, Loki? We did watch it. I did. I liked it. 
You didn't I, like I it? I was fine with it. Yeah. I thought it was... I, I, I liked the aesthetic and the, the style. I think I don't like Loki. Oh, oh, well. Oh, do not tell Beauty Cork. I know. I don't tell oh. like most of my female friends, I think. Oh, oh. yeah. I don't. Do you not like the character or you don't like... Uh, Tom Hiddleston? Name? Both. Oh. oh. Yeah, That's I'm definitely unfortunate the because there. Tom Hiddleston is our guest today. He's about to oh, die. Oh. Just kidding. Um, no, I don't have a problem with... I don't have a problem with him. I just don't think I like the Loki character. Well, he's unlikable. I don't like him either. Are we supposed to like him? Yeah. Really? He's... Yeah. My favorite Loki moment was in one of those movies in probably the first Avengers or something. I can't keep him straight. But there's this all hell is breaking loose and Loki is being a pain in the ass. And the Hulk just sort of picks him up and goes thump, 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 thump. <laughs> yeah. That was awesome. That's pretty great. Yeah. So... I I in in this in I I liked this show which has this temporal variant authority or something the time mm -hmm. police the TVA and the whole sort of aesthetic of it is very 1980s in the TVA this like the, it kind is of it 80s it's earlier it, than that but they sort of I don't know sort but of like it was a mixture of sort of 70s and, like the, and 80s yeah, kind but of but thing but like the TVs and the propaganda -y stuff they used reminded me of like more 60s glory stuff yeah yeah but uh, my favorite part of this show also was when at the beginning Loki gets socked in the jaw and you get to see him suffering in ultra slow motion. That was hilarious. <laughs> I'm just going to watch the first part of the show again, just see that. So that's why I like, Lo I don't, I don't like Loki, but yeah, I, he I, suffers, I, which is hilarious. It was okay. It was fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I can't decide if I like the, the premise of the TVA or not. Okay. It's a very like commonly used thing in other. Yeah. I kind of, yeah. I like Owen Wilson. Yeah. He's well, there you go. Uh, let's talk about this giant arc. Giant arc? Um, is this the one in, like, Tennessee or Kentucky? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Not no, that not. one. It's even bigger. It's, it's <gasps> Whoa. Friggin' huge. And, and it's spelled with a C. Even okay. more cosmological. Even bigger, even older, even more cosmological. Yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah. So this, uh, one of the fundamental assumptions in cosmology i shouldn't say assumption but originally it was an assumption is that the universe on the largest scales is the same everywhere that if you took a big box and looked at all the stuff in that big box on one side of the universe on the other side of the universe over there over there over there that there'd be roughly the same amount of stuff distributed right. in the same way in each box right the various different ways that you could sort of characterize that it's not going to be identical no no i'm only going to be in one of those boxes right, right. right. in, in t tiny the other detail, box it's different. there's no, not going to be but there's roughly the same amount of stuff distributed in roughly the same way uh this this is called homogeneity right mm -hmm. and isotropy of the universe is the same in every direction you look and it's the same in every place you look and this is a fundamental assumption that it was like that that uh that, that einstein made way back in the day okay. um and it's called the cosmological principle um that's pretty that sounds super important it's, it's like ridiculous it's, it's, the, it is the cosmological principle the cosmological sounds like, principle it's like the prime directive in star trek <laughs> yeah. it's like yeah. okay you got to start there if you're yeah, not you know but they don't really you're not on board with this often, so. which is true and that's kind of related here that's right. oh, breaking yes. the prime directive so are we or are we not yeah so uh, we kind of made that assumption 100 years ago when when cosmology was first kind of becoming a science noobs um and in the years since then it seems like it has passed the tests that is when we look at galaxy counts that way versus that way versus that way you get roughly the same number as long as you're looking on large scales and uh question is, is that, is it really true? And, and to, to do that, you'd have to kind of like map out where everything in the universe is. That's of course a very tall order. Right. Um, there were hints about a decade ago when we looked at the data from, uh, the cosmic microwave background that it possibly couldn't be true. People got excited. I don't know if you guys remember when yeah, it was like a, from a cold spot, right. On the, in the, in the first in the Kobe, which is the cosmic the first background one. explorer one. And then again in Planck, the, the right. cosmic microwave background stuff, the, a little spot in the – not a little spot, a big spot in the sky, colder than the rest that – And these were – so those um, – both of those were space observatories that looked in all, every direction mm -hmm. at, in the sky at the brightness of the – what's called the the – black the background radiation left over from the big bang right which is cooled now from our perspective to 2.7 kelvin right so it's a very very long wavelength infrared 
or beyond uh, radiation, and it's virtually the same brightness everywhere you look. And these maps that are usually presented in blue and red mm-hmm. show po- parts beautiful. that are my s- favorite images in the slightly front. warmer and slightly cooler than that 2.7. It right. has a splotchiness. Right. And then they sort of characterize that splotchiness to see. And so there was one right. spot that seemed right. a little bit too spotty. Yeah, and we expect the spl- we expect it to be splotchy on small scales, right? Because the universe isn't the same everywhere on small scales, but on large scales, yeah. we don't expect the splotchiness. But we you know, there was a little bit more splotchiness on bigger scales than we expect. That's since been kind of uh, with better with better statistical analysis and stuff. It's it's been explained away. It's not it's not actually a big deal, but maybe we have another possible big deal. So mm. uh, one of the great. Uh, surveys that we've been doing in astronomy for the last few decades is this thing called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. I'm sure we've talked about data from that mm-hmm. and various things before. Uh, this is a, you know, a uh, we had a dedicated uh, telescope out in New Mexico that was mapping out the sky for a couple decades, just looking at both positions and redshifts, that is uh, how far away these things are, for I think close to or over now a billion objects, objects being distant galaxies for the most part, and quasars galaxies, and things right, yeah, yeah. Um, mapping out what the universe looks like and so uh, a, a very recent i say very recent because it was just last week uh, a big meeting of the uh, american, american astronomical, astronomical society, society right uh, there was a talk given where they they showed some results from the sloan digital sky survey indicating that maybe uh, the universe is not <laughs> the same so the, in, in 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 brief we mentioned an arc they well, so they were looking at absorption of certain wavelengths of light. They were using quasars as background sources of light right. and looking at the absorption of the quasar light by um, magnesium. Something like that, yeah. And, yeah. And, and sort of mapping out the distribution of that, of that stuff. interfering stuff because right. the quasars are very far away. Right. Yeah, you run into trouble because like, if you're just mapping galaxies, you're only kind of mapping the nearby universe because mm-hmm. – Galaxies that are really far away are dim, and you can't see them unless you stare at them for a ridiculous amount of time. And so if you want to see further away things, what you can do is look at the light as it passes through that stuff. Um, light from ridiculously distant, ridiculously bright things, which are the quasars, right. and as it passes through that stuff. And so uh, they looked at that light passing you know, from these quasars. It's not the quasars that were distributed weirdly, but... The stuff in the, between us and the quasars. The stuff in between them because it seemed to be there's that is there seems to be in, in one particular part of the sky this fairly linear arc like arc like structure in yeah. the stuff. Um, That's about how big is it? It's uh, something so, like three billion light years long. Yes. Wow. That's pretty long. And which nine is, billion light years away or something like that. Yeah. It's very distant. Very very. That's large. I mean that's. Even though it's most of the distance of the, of the universe away, it's still like 20 times you know, 10 degrees in our sky or something like that. Which yeah. is So if this is real, then this pre- presents so, a very serious problem so, for cosmology. So there's two aspects to the if it's real part. One is like are the observations got some problem in them because right. they missed something and there's an analysis or there's some other source like we've had. We've talked about stories like that before where like, oh, something very exciting, you know, has been discovered from some observational thing. And it turns out that, no, that exciting thing was actually caused by some other phenomena that sort of contaminated your observation. So that's one part of the is this, is this real. Right. The other part gets to something you mentioned a second ago about the previous Kobe and Planck measurements, which is, oh, we did some more sophisticated statistical analysis of yeah. it and decided it was OK. Yep. And so – you know, their picture of this arc is some dots. Yeah. And and when you look at, we're all looking at them here. <laughs> they all have the picture of dots on our screens. And when you look at it, it is true that without reading the caption, I'm like, oh, is the arc that thing that sort of looks a little bit like a smile in the mm-hmm. center of the picture? And then you read the caption. Yeah. But there's also like maybe a structure up above that too. But then there's also, yeah, that like oh, above that, there's the eyebrows, you yeah. know, up there. And <laughs> maybe then you're it should like, be oh, the giant smiley face. It, maybe it should be, you know, and then it's like, well, we're people. We like to connect dots. And I so do then love we. connecting dots. It's yeah. so fun. Sometimes you make pictures. Yeah. And sometimes you make a giant arc across the yeah. universe. And so 
to make sure that we're not doing that, then we do these statistical tests to say, what's the chance that if you were just plopping, so the cosmological principle, right, would say you, the dots are just plopped down in random. These dots represent some distribution of matter, right? right. And if right. we just plop them down in random, there, you know, sometimes you're going to plop one down right next to another one. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you might even plop two down right next to another one. And then you got three in a row, ooh, right? Right. <laughs> The longer that line gets, the less likely that is to happen by chance. But also, the more dots you plop down, the more likely it is that you're going to end up with a bunch kind of next to each other. So they do these statistical tests, right? Mm -hmm. And what's the result they found? Well, the result they claimed, so they did a few different statistical tests uh, on the same data. And they claimed to something like five sigma that it was not... By chance, that is that the, the the they claim that the probability this happens by chance, randomly plopping things down, is some ridiculous small thing. Yeah, point tiny... zero 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 three percent. Right. Uh, but um, and that at the same time, people are like, well, this is tentative. It's not conclusive. Right. We need something more compelling. Well, so what's what's the problem with zero point zero 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 three percent chance that it happened by chance? Yeah. Uh, I feel like we have a rant building here. Well, <laughs> for, Which I love. I love yeah. well, for lots rant. of these things, they do a statistical test, but a statistical test is always checking a very specific, well-posed hypothesis. And you might be able to reject that hypothesis at the five sigma level, but that is not the same as rejecting. I'm sure that the that their five sigma result is not, it's not what is the chance that the cosmological principle is correct? It's less than 1%. That's not the, yeah. the statistical test, right? It has something to do with saying, I have a box of sky this big, mm -hmm. and I have 150 marbles, and I place the 150 marbles drawing a random number generator, and when I do that, how often do I get something that has the kind of correlation that this particular smiley face has. And that is very much less than 1%. Yeah. And that's a very different thing than this is really not a random thing. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to do? How are we going to uh, determine whether this is a real thing or not? Because it is like, it's, you know, the, Josh's rant is, is, is dead on. That is, these statistical tests hide the complication kind of. Uh, and But it's important that we figure out whether this is real or not. That is... If there's something causing structure on these scales, we need to know about it because that really radically alters our picture of how cosmology works. So if it really isn't a kind of random artifact, then this is truly important. So we have to and figure it, out ways to to do the kind of the first test that Josh mentioned, that is, test is, is this consistent or inconsistent with the cosmological principle in some robust way. And I'm not – and I want to be clear. I'm not saying they shouldn't have done – those kinds of idealized. I do those things all the time when I'm, you know, in my research, you get something weird and like, okay, what are the chances that that this is something going on physical in the universe versus something that just sort of happens because you're looking at a whole bunch of numbers and sometimes the numbers look funny, yeah. right. right? Which is basically what this is, right? right? And all I'm trying to say is that the fact that the numbers look funny and they're not looking funny due to some random number process doesn't necessarily get you from there to the cosmological principle right. is broken. Right. Uh, in answer to your query about what do we do. <laughs> what do we do? I think we are going to keep a very close eye on the situation. Mm, interesting. <laughs> keep studying it. Yes. Seems reasonable. Yeah. There's There's been some other large scale structures that we've observed in the universe with other techniques. Yeah. What about those? Yes. Like well, those, the those have, wall right. and stuff like that. Those things are on yeah. on smaller scales, uh, ah. on scales that don't worry us about when it comes the cosmological to the cosmology. Principle. As much. Right. So so this one is so huge uh -huh. uh, that... How big is it? This <laughs> it is it is. Big. Uh, I once saw a cosmological <laughs> arc this big. <laughs> so I, I think that one thing that definitely could be done. Uh, so one thing about the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is it, uh, it mapped about 35% of the sky, but that leaves a lot of sky left to minute. be mapped. 65%. Oh, 
good math. Um, and so it'd be great to do that as well and see if there are are more departures from mm-hmm. uh, randomness and so forth uh, is, is definitely one thing we have to do. Um, we also have to, you know, like I said, like you said as well, there's, there's always a lot of room for kind of systematic error in this kind of thing. And I, I'm kind of with you here. This, this doesn't really convince me. Um, not that I'm, you know, uh, you know, it would be awesome in some sense if, uh, if the cosmological <laughs> principle was violated, because yeah. that would mean a lot of new physics that we are. It'd be, it'd be really awesome if it really were a smiley face. Can you <laughs> that imagine would that would be amazing? That would that be would more be evidence for aliens <laughs> and UFOs that the government's been. Yeah, yeah that would be, yet. that would be something. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, we'll keep an eye on it. All right. The Colwell Digital Sky Survey is coming out for the okay. remaining 65%. Right. Okay. There you go. Hey, we're friends, right? Most of the time. Yeah. More or less. Oh, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and you know, there was a TV show called Friends. I do know that. They just had a reunion. Oh, no. I'm going to do so <laughs> poorly at this. <laughs> Can I phone a friend for this? Um, no. Okay. No. Uh They just had a reunion, and it got me thinking about uh, um, friends and science fiction. Oh, okay. okay. And actors, you know, as you know, for example, of the three of us, Uh only one has been in a science fiction movie. It's true. I have an IMDb page. Okay, well, congratulations. Thanks, I don't know who made it. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, And similarly, the friends of the TV sitcom Friends... Some of them have science fiction acting credits, but not all. Oh. Oh. Only some acted in genre pieces, shall we say, prior to their breakout stardom in Friends. I shall list to you six, the six Friends actors Uh with a science fiction role Uh that they may or may not have had prior to Friends. Okay. Some of them they did. Some of them they did not. Okay. Mm-hmm. Your challenge will be to determine which Purple. ones are real and which ones are not. Okay? Okay. Interesting. Uh, Matthew Perry uh-huh. on Second Chance, a TV show in 1987, as the younger version of a man from the future with a second chance at living well. Okay. Lisa Kudrow in the movie Saturn III in 1980 as an engineer on Kirk Douglas's mining ship. Okay. Hmm. David Schwimmer in a recurring guest role in the TV show Starman in 1986, based on the 1984 film, as a friend of the alien played by Robert Hayes, who was played by Jeff Bridges in the movie, by the way. Courtney Cox on Misfits of Science in 1985 as a telekinetic teen. Ooh. Matt LeBlanc in a guest role as an android mining the radioactive substance Sarlax in the TV series Otherworld in 1985. And finally, Jennifer Aniston as the occasional love interest of holographic crime fighter Auto Man, A U T O Man, not O T T O Man. That would be interesting, though. In the series of that same name in 1984. A Norwegian feature. Some of those, and I can tell you how many, but more than one. Are correct. Are correct. Are true. Are true. Huh. Okay. Uh Okay. Uh-huh. Are we random? And and some are not. I won't tell you how many, but also more than one. Analysis. You can do do some stuff. Yeah, yeah. So that's one, one of those. So, I'll, I'll save it for the answer time. Save, save, it. save it for the answer that's time. Before we get to the answer time, uh, let's check in. There were some other stuff that's sort of related to the digital sun sky survey. We're going to tell you. About. Yeah, this was this was something we need. We needed uh, maybe we need a guest on for this or something like that. But I we ran across. Uh, this cool thing, you know, uh, Josh, you were telling me earlier about how uh, one sad thing when people talk to uh, see you or about uh, your work, your research, you're like, it's this really cool. But, you know, a, a good question is like, how is the understanding how Saturn's rings is or yeah, is how is that going to how is that going to help humanity? It doesn't cure like, cancer or anything, yeah. but it could. I make clear to make I make it I I proudly affirm that it will not cure cancer <laughs> just to make clear that I am not trying to pull any BS or right, right. anything, you know. Right. The occasional time I talk to a reporter, they're like, why does the person on the street care about this? I'm like, well, it's not going to cure cancer, but it's pretty freaking interesting. It's pretty cool. Yeah, we all think that what we do is really, really awesome and interesting and important in and some it, sense. Yeah, and often and it helps us develop models of things and different numerical techniques. Mm-hmm. Right, and different exactly what relates statistics. to this. So it turns out that... Uh, 
some of the tools used in the Sloan or you know devised and produced to analyze the data for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, the same survey we were just talking about, mm-hmm. have been applied to cancer stuff. Oh, <laughs> cancer stuff. Cancer so it's stuff. A, it's a new platform called Astropath. That has been made available to like help with image analysis because it's it's used for SDSS has these big sets of images that they stitch together lots of images and right. have to analyze them and yeah like we said we said like a billion uh, objects in there so it's very it's you know it's it's challenging is the, to is it a is I mean is this a, like a publicly available tool or something yes. like that for image analysis that it's they've a new made platform that's available for imaging analysis and yes. they've been using it they made publicly available okay. And it's and it's being used to analyze it's being used images. to analyze images of cancer cells and stuff. So so that they, you know, they do. And I don't. I know almost nothing about this, right? But they they mark these molecules with different uh, fluorescent markers, and then take images of those things. And, and then that. But again, it's like millions of pixels worth of stuff of different. You know. I don't know no, I'm laughing. Saying. I googled astropath and I got a bunch of Warhammer results. Oh. So, which, is a, which is a game. Huh. Uh, a game. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, and probably a bunch of porn. You can't Google anything without finding. I. That's not what comes up usually in my searches, but. Oh, I'm doing, yeah, I don't know I'm doing it wrong. I don't know what you're talking about. I, uh, is porn is on computers? <laughs> I didn't wasn't aware of that. But um, but that's really cool. But yeah. you know, it's something developed for astronomy is now helping to cure cancer. I, okay. have, an, I have a particular interest in this because it's especially being used for some melanoma research, and I've had a melanoma. Oh no! So, yeah. So they use this to study, like looking at um, things that they've biopsied and immune cells, and look at for different biomarkers and stuff like that. But. They have different models that they're using this other database to fit. Okay, so they're so the the software finds patterns. Yeah, mm-hmm. yep. like smiley faces like in smiley. the <laughs> galaxies, and maybe something that's meaningful about the distribution of cancer cells and how to right. do something about them. Right, which is to a broader sense, my research still isn't going to cure cancer. I'm not going to claim it does, uh, but just is another of the many examples of the serendipities of basic research. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, trying to figure stuff out. Sometimes you figure things out that you weren't planning to figure out yeah. when you're doing yeah. that. And if you're not trying to figure stuff out, you're probably not going to figure anything out. Indeed. That's right. And sometimes instead of using of models wisdom. to figure things out, we still use humans and do things by eye. I'm changing topics. Oh, that was I thought you were like, we're doing experiment. I thought you were like, <laughs> uh, the image that was coming to mind is like, you know, Using humans as test subjects, but oh, you're talking you about the human brain as an analysis yes, tool. Yes, yes. Yeah. Segwaying into another short oh, yeah. topic. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of these. There's a there's a, a whole range of things called citizen science projects that I, I think we've talked about before in different. A little settings. bit, but it's worth um, sort of describing what yeah. those are. And so how I they love work. citizen science projects, and I think they're awesome. And I, when I teach the introductory astronomy classes, especially the honors class, I have my students do some projects on them. Ooh. Oh, nice. Which is fun. Have you ever um, done any yourself? Like, yeah, because I know. tested all of them out before oh, okay. I gave them to my students and I had to come up with questions and stuff. Oh, nice. So. Um, but so there's a bunch. There's um, there's this, there's one called Galaxy Zoo that's sort of uh, one of the classic ones. But there's this whole realm um, in the zooniverse of these citizen science projects that are uh, primarily a lot of them are astronomy, but they actually have a ton of others now that are like um, there's this cool one that's like ancient ship logs that they scanned in and you look for like weather pattern, ancient weather patterns and stuff like that. Oh wow! And there's a bunch of like biology ones and people doing things like tracking bird locations. And so it, it comes in a lot of different forms but citizen science generally involves using the power of lots of citizens who are interested in science to help you analyze your data because a lot of data can't be is not as easily analyzed by machine yet which just not machines aren't as good at finding patterns yet as human eyes are a lot of times yeah and when it comes to things like recording the data and stuff like that sometimes you just need humans yeah there was one so in the very, very early days, and it's not really citizen science, it was sort of home computer science, the, the SETI at home. Oh, SETI yeah, SETI at home. Yeah. Where they were that just like, take advantage ones. of people, the fact that lots and lots of people have computers, like, well, when those computer, when those people are sleeping, let's have the computers do something. Yeah, it was sort of run in the background. Yeah. And, and I then, did take a look at I, maybe the one you're referring to, the galaxies, where you sort of classify galaxies. Mm-hmm. And there's, yeah. Jim was talking about a billion galaxies or whatever. And uh, so most of these are 
tiny little smudges in the yeah. astronomical images, but classifying whether it's a sort of spiral galaxy or not. And the Zooniverse is sort of a common platform for a lot of these citizen science projects. Yeah, so a lot of projects that use bigger data sets these days um, will collaborate with the people who run the Zooniverse platforms and will help make that data available at some point, um, usually not too long after the start of the project these days, um, where they put up some of the data on the platform, so things like Kepler data, um, and in the case of what we're going to talk about, some test data. Um, But in all of these, then, they sort of come up with ways that they want people to classify things. And citizen scientists, just people at home, can go through and click on things and highlight things. Yeah. And it's actually included in some NASA projects as an official part of how they're going to do stuff. Yeah. Is we're going to use Zooniverse. Mm -hmm. We're going to put some data out there. We're going to test things to make sure that it works, Mm -hmm. you know, and then get a lot more data analyzed that way. Yeah, yeah, it's a really great way to, to involve the public, but also to have the sort of resources yeah. and get more stuff done, especially with these huge data sets we have these days. Yeah. Um, so, like, a lot of cool stuff has come from Kepler from that. Um, you were you mentioned Galaxy Zoo. There was some, like, there was the green, I forget what they're, those, like, green blobs people found. There's a better name for it. Hanny's something. Hanny's or something like that. Or yeah, or something like that. You guys are making noises, just, but I have no <laughs> idea what you're talking about. Um, green blobs. Bobs and panty for warping or something. What? <laughs> let's just so let's talk about the giant planets one day. Uh, so so there's there's a newer paper and so and so one of the cool things that's come out of this also is that um, these citizen scientists identify things and then the sort of um, professional quote unquote scientists behind the scenes take these results and usually write them up for publications. They say, okay, what are we seeing trends here? Right. Are we finding new planets? Things like that. And then they write them up for publication. And a lot of times, the, some of the citizen scientists are included in the publication, nice. which is yeah. pretty awesome. Um, so there's just there's a new one that's um, come out from the Planet Hunters TESS uh, Citizen Science Project. Um, this is using the TESS satellite, which again is an exoplanet, uh, transiting exoplanet satellite survey, something like survey satellite. <laughs> survey satellite, yep. Um That is, uh, so they, they have a new study of the discovery of two exoplanets um, that lists a bunch of these uh, citizen scientists as co-authors. co-authors. Yeah. Um, so it's orbiting two planets orbiting a star HD 152843, which is located about 352 light years away. Natch. Um, and it's similar <laughs> to the sun, but it's a little bit younger. So it's brighter and bigger. Um, I don't know if yeah. so it is. but And so it has, um, then these planets are a little bit bigger than the Earth. Um, one of them has pretty f- close in. The other is a little bit further out, but it's sort of fun. Yeah. The uh, yeah the paper's abstract says three transit events from two planets were detected by citizen scientists. Yeah, the, yeah. awesome. Yeah, so that's super cool. So get involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and if you're not interested in necessarily classifying like uh, space things, which I'm pretty sure everybody you are, but everybody should there be. There also is a lot of yeah. There's a lot of cool just other random science projects right. on, in the Zooniverse now. Zooniverse. Z o o n iverse. Iverse. Right. Dot org. Yeah. And there's a couple of other websites out there, but that's the sort of big That's the main one I've heard about, and it's frequently used as sort of like a standard platform uh, when NASA's like evaluating proposals for these things. It's like, oh, okay. About fossil leaves. They know what they're doing. So that's cool. Aurora. You, can, you know what you can do with your doing a citizen scientist? You can get together and do that with your friends. <gasps> you can. You can. Yeah. Speaking of friends. Whoa. Uh, here you go. Here's your list again. All right. You ready? I'm going to read it. Then you're going to say yes or no. Okay. All right, go for it. Matthew Perry on Second Chance in 1987 is the younger version of a man from the future with a second chance at living well. I think that one is real. Real. Uh, should I tell you whether you're right or not now or wait till we've gone all the way through? I'll tell you We now. don't know how many are correct, so you should tell us now. That is real. Yes. Well done. Good I job. think I'd heard of that one. Lisa Kudrow in the movie Saturn Three in 1980 as an engineer on Kirk Douglas's mining ship. Not Kirk, Kirk Douglas. It's not Kirk Douglas's mining ship, but a character played by Kirk Douglas. Fake. Real. It is fake. That's what I thought. Uh, that's a real movie, really with Kirk Douglas, but it was Farrah Fawcett. Farrah Fawcett oh. was in that movie. Wow. David Schwimmer in a recurring guest role in Starman in 1986, based on the 1984 film, as a friend of the alien, played by Robert Hayes. Did you, you go see? first this time. Real. Fake. Addie. Yes. 
Yeah, that's fake. Real show, Robert Hayes, real movie, 1984, which I really enjoyed with uh, Jeff Bridges as the alien. Uh Uh, But David Schwimmer was not anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. Courtney Cox on Misfits of Science in 1985 as a telekinetic teen. Real. So freaking real. One of my top 10 favorite shows of all time, Misfits Uh, of Science. I love it. Really? All right. Well, you're both Much. you're both uh, three for four, so you're doing very well. We should have a watch. When I was a kid, sometime. that was my favorite show. Mm. Well, interesting. I've never seen it either. Matt LeBlanc in a guest role as an well, android. Well, you were very young in 1985. You might. That's not true. Have seen I'm not yet. Yeah. <laughs> Jim is showing his age here. Matt LeBlanc in a guest role as an android mining the radioactive substance Sarlax, not to be confused with the Sarlacc pit from uh, The Empire Strikes Back, uh, in the TV series Otherworld in 1985. Fake. Fake. You're both right. Yeah. Uh, And finally, Jennifer Aniston as an occasional love interest of holographic crime fighter of the title character of the show Auto Man. Is he like in 1984? Or is he just an automatic person? He's like, it's like Tron. He was like a Tron kind of character that came out of the Troniverse into the real world. Okay. He's holographic. Real. Real. Wrong. Oh, that's oh, fake. So I managed. I, I managed. Tied. You did tie. You both did very well. So was only one of six. them real? No, two. two, two. The Courtney right, Cox right. and Matthew that's Perry. Right. Yeah, and the others were made up. Yeah. Mm. Nice. Well, yeah. Good I managed a good couple. I managed to get a couple of you. you got got you each fooled a couple of times. Uh, while it may have felt like binge watching Auto Man, <laughs> it was just another episode of Walk About the Galaxy. Write us a review as a comment. In the video on YouTube of Gangnam Style, just because it has over 4 billion views. There's got to be a more recent video that has more views than that. I don't think so. Really? Maybe there is, but 4 billion is a lot of views. (laughs) But nobody's looking at it anymore. I know. Okay, Uh, But we need to be associated with that somehow. Um, okay. Maybe we'll do our next music video as a cover of it because we're really out of date. Yeah, I, as you were just pointing I remember out. a lot of those videos 20 years ago. I know, right? It wasn't it was that like long ago. ago. Man. It was a joke. I know. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram to get all our updates and check out our website at walkaboutthegalaxy.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Walk About the Galaxy, where you can see most of our episodes, some of our bloopers, and all of our music videos. Our episodes, by the way, are soon to uh, benefit from the Some professional higher production quality production professional production services of our production assistant Diego Rodriguez who is returning to the show after a brief hiatus catch up on old episodes wherever you get your podcasts follow us on Twitter at walk underscore the underscore galaxy and ask us questions anywhere using hashtag ask WTG our theme music was composed by Richard Jerusik thanks to our listeners in Maryland and around the world. Stay safe. I'm Josh Caldwell. I'm Addie Dove. And I'm Jim Cooney. We're the Astrocorks signing off until the next episode of Walk About the Galaxy.